here I am. It's just me today, folks. Malia's had a very busy weekend, and uh, I told her I would uh, take care of this one. So let's see. My camera's a little, a little off here. I'm going to... Um, I'm going to jump over and correct that while you guys get settled in. Welcome to the uh, Saturday live stream. There we go. I like that better. That should be better. Okay. There we go. Hey, let's all... Uh, Say hello to, let's all, it's just me. Um, we have D. Dorothy, Oregon Music Fan, Crystal Fire, Crypto Alchemist, Megalithic Yard. D uh, blah, blah, blah. I said D. Dorothy, right? Yep, 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 yep. Wooey Translations. Well, welcome to you from all the way over there in Germany. And Bob Marley and Tessa 1111, Johnny Sides here. And ShadowNet, Aaron's Energy 313. Mike does Shane Walker. Mike does Shane Walker. <laughs> okay, sorry. I'm just reading what's on there. Um, sorry, Mike. Sorry, Shane. <laughs> Greg Betts and Joe, Joey Charlie. Hey, Joey Charlie. Darcy Edmonds. Well, hello, 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 and I'm sure more people will jump into the live stream. So uh, today is going to be just kind of a potpourri of a few things. I'm going to start by reminding all of you that um, my label, Lost Connet Library, uh, released this uh, classic reprint edition of two of Edgar Rice Burroughs' Hollow Earth novels at the Earth's Core and Pellucidar. And these are um, classic reprints. And if you've never read the Edgar Rice Burroughs Pellucidar stories, and, and you like classic old-timey adventure, you want to get this Tales of the Hollow Earth from my uh, main label, Lost Continent Library. You can see the, um, the name of the company right there in the left side banner. And, you know, going on business, um, my gosh, almost 22 years now. So uh, that's, that's pretty cool. But get this edition. You'll really like it if you're into, uh, particularly if you're an Edgar Rice Burroughs fan, but if you're into um, classic adventure fiction, you'll want that. Now, um, Here's a book that I have not finished reading, and I'm going to be jumping in because I, I do read the whole thing. I don't just pick and choose, but this is an interesting topic. Um, this is kind of a companion volume to David Childress's book on the Hanabu Saucer. Now, you guys know that what I think of the Hanabu Saucer. I think it's complete fantasy fabrication. Um, and uh, I gave a review to David's book on, on Hanabu. And as I said, you know, David presents what's out there. You know, he tells you, hey, here's what's out there about this particular topic. You decide, you know, what you want to believe. David's not one of those that hits you over the head with what he thinks you should believe. Oh, um, I've had some people ask me about this particular mug. This is the Miskatonic University mug. Now, if you are an HP Lovecraft fan, you'll know what Miskatonic University is. You can get this at the HP Lovecraft Historical Society website, which is hplhs.com or .org or net, one of those, but hplhs, go there. They have cool stuff, and they're really, really nice guys. If you remember, about a year or so ago, a um, couple of years ago, maybe not quite that. In fact, it wasn't quite that long. 
ago, I don't think. Um, anyway, I was on Cardinal Sin's show, and um, he had as his guest the two guys. Um, uh, gosh, I'm doing a brain dump. I, oh, Andrew Lehman and Sean Branny. They're the guys who founded the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society, which is based uh, out near, I think it's in Glendale or just north of Pasadena or whatever. And I got to be on the show kind of sitting in as uh, he talked with those guys. And I've been a fan of what they do um, with Lovecraft's material for a while. So it was really cool for me to be on that show with Gil uh, talking with those two guys. Um, so uh, I still haven't made it to their brick and mortar location, which I, I intend to this calendar year. But um, anyway, Andromeda, the secret files, the flying submarines of the SS. Well, let's jump into this for a minute. I'm going to be talking about, you know, some other stuff as well. Um this book has interesting illustrations that, uh, let me see here. I'm trying to find some ones that'll be easy to see. Oh, hey, there we go. There is, there is one of the Hanabu models. As you guys know, when you, uh, uh, I was, I was gifted the Hanabu, and um, I built it in the kind of the bronze look, right, to make it look old and ancient, but there, there's the Hanabu model. Uh, now, that's the one by what's called Squadron. There's uh, There's been a couple. There's three companies. Ravel, the one I built is Ravel, but Squadron did one, and... Um, the company that's even lesser known than Squadron, I think. So that's why I don't remember the name. But uh, the, the, basically, this book attempts to offer a possible explanation for the tubular UFOs, cylindrical, I'm sorry, cylindrical UFOs that have been reportedly uh, emerging from the seas for several years. And these are alleged photos of, of them. Now, I have a friend that I've known since college, a buddy of mine named Mike. And his father was an aerospace engineer and worked on um, one or two of the Apollo missions in one of the Southern California plants down, um, down this way. And they lived for a while in Torrance, California. Those of you familiar with your Southern California geography, you know where Torrance is located. It's just um, adjacent to Redondo Beach and that area, just um, north of uh, uh, north of San Pedro, east of Rancho Palos Verdes. RPV, it's called. Now, one day. Um, Mike, Mike was at home. His, his parents were there and, um, he and his father were inside the house. Mike's mom was outside, uh, I think literally hanging laundry on the line. And, uh, he says how it goes was he and his father suddenly heard and felt this kind of humming rumble sound this you know when um when a when a power generator of a certain type you know is is generating that kind of, it was like a a beam energy kind of sound and feel they could hear it they could feel it um this lasted a few moments, um, not quite a minute. And then when it stopped, about a moment later, Mike says his mom came walking in the house and she was just stunned. Um, they asked her, did you hear that? And she didn't, had not heard anything 
Um, but she had seen something. And what she saw was a large cylinder. Okay. It was over the water because there's places in Torrance where, you know, you're right there next to um, Redondo Beach and just a little further down um, PCH, Pacific Coast Highway, is the water. And um, what she saw was hovering, you know, above the water, out where the water was. And um, she could tell that it had lifted from the water because she could see whatever it running off. It was a huge cylinder shape um, with a double row of, you know, what she could best describe as some type of glass or, or something, you know, that you could see through um, windows, for lack of a better explanation, some type of rectangular structure like that, that was different from the material on the rest of the object. Now, um, what was interesting was she did not hear the noise. She saw this object, but Mike and his dad heard and felt the noise. Of course, they were inside, so they couldn't see the object. Now, Mike's dad, if you ever had met him, it, he's just one of those no-nonsense, no-bullshit guys, okay? Um, it, it, you didn't sit around talking about paranormal stuff or UFOs with Mike's dad, with Mr. Williamson. A.P. Williamson was his name. But he had no qualms about talking about that incident. He would tell, would have told you that, yep, they heard it. They felt it. It was just like what Mike said. And when his mom came in the house, um, she described what she saw. Now, if you're familiar with Torrance, you also know that the city of Carson is just to the south of Torrance, south of the 110 freeway right there. And uh, down in Carson is the Goodyear Blimp uh, hangar in Airfield that the Goodyear Blimp uses. So these folks are used to seeing the Blimp on a regular basis. When I was in, um, when I was at my first assignment in the Air Force, we lived on base housing. Now, even though the base is in El Segundo, a little little bit north, residential base housing is at Fort MacArthur in San Pedro. So we were there for two years. And yeah, we saw the uh, blimp several times when we would go down to the Ikea in Carson or go to the drive-in movie or something, or we were headed on the 405 down to San Diego. So my point is, when you see that thing a lot, you're very familiar with what it looks like, okay? So... You're not going to get it confused with something else when you're used to seeing it. And my point is, uh, Mrs. Williamson was not confusing the blimp for some, for what she saw. Okay. The way she described it, you know, flat ends, cylindrical. Okay. The blimp is, you know, rounded ends, tapered, and it's bulged, you know, in the middle. And come on, the thing that they run the letters across the sign is usually saying some type of, you know, happy St. Patrick's day or, or, uh, you know, uh, clear view Ford or, or whatever. Okay. And this was none of that. So what she saw, you know, to her mind was a bona fide UFO and it was pretty big. And she described it as the, the impression she got was it had lifted up out of the sea. Um, now when you put that together with Mike and his dad's description, um, well, you know, they were clearly hearing or feeling the propulsion system, the power generator, whatever this was. Um, I do not recall, um, the end of her sighting. I would have to talk to Mike and ask him if it, if it blinked out or what. I just remember her description. So, oh, and by the way, Mike is somebody who is not, he's more like his dad. I, I haven't had a whole lot of paranormal discussions with Mike. He's just, you know, he's, he's an architect by trade and, 
And, you know, he's just a very down to earth guy, but he'd tell you, he experienced that. That was definitely a, a real experience. So, you know, I found that, I've always found that interesting. So as I, years later, started hearing about um, these flying submarines and, uh, you know, seeing the images that people, you know, are presenting, uh, it really resonated with me because it, you know, there's, there's one right there. See this one here? That's an alleged image of it coming. Uh, you know, it, it has come up out of the ocean already. There it is. Em wait, there it is emerging, right? Now, there are submarines that fire missiles and such. Um, but short of having examined a bunch of photos of missiles emerging, the photos that I have seen of ballistic missiles emerging from a submarine launch, emerging from the ocean during a submarine launch, don't look like that. They're not blunt-ended. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm i inclined to... I, I certainly do think that um, this is an alleged cylindrical UFO over China. Um, supposedly a... Uh, I don't know if that emerged from the sea or not. Yeah, I do not doubt that um, my buddy Mike and his, his parents had the experience that they had. Uh, we can't say we know for sure what exactly it was that they did experience other than what they heard and what his mom saw. Um, so I'm intrigued with the basic idea. It's like so many of these things. There's reason to find it intriguing. There's reason to look more uh, closely at it, you know, but, but you got to be careful with um, some of the, the claims that people make, because unfortunately there are liars out there that want attention. Now, here's a photo. Uh, this remarkable craft was photographed in Rhode Island in 1968 by Joseph Ferrier and presented to Project Blue Book. Blue Book, apparently, U.S. Air Force, had no explanation. Yeah, right there. So, what, dear viewers, are we to think about that? Um, I have read segments of this book. So some of it's highlighted. Uh, let me pick out. Um, let me pick one out here. June 1947 on the SS Landovery Castle and route to Cape Town and going through the Straits of Madagascar about the beginning of July was on deck with another lady passenger, the, the witness was on deck with another lady passenger at approximately 11 p.m. when we noticed a particularly bright star. It was traveling very fast and approached the ship. Suddenly a searchlight appeared, which flashed a strong beam of light on the water within 50 yards of the ship. It descended, its beam shortening and becoming brighter as it neared the water. And the next instant there was no more light, but an object appeared, apparently made of steel and shaped like a cigar cut at the rear end, I guess flat. It remained in the air about 20 feet above the sea, parallel with the Landovery Castle, and traveling in the same direction as the ship. Gaining a little in speed, after a second or two, the whole shape disappeared without a sound, from the rear issuing fierce flames which shot out to about half the length of the object. It appeared that there must be something like a huge furnace inside the thing, but still we could hear no noise from the flames. So it puts on, oh, the object was very large, about four times the length of the ship, the Landovery Castle, and at a rough guess, about four times as high. We had a wonderful view, but in a few seconds, it disappeared. No light was seen forward as it left. It just vanished soundlessly into the darkness. So that's another one of those that, 
they didn't hear anything, but it put on a show of some type of um, ejecta, some type of um, propulsion, right? Exhaust, fiery rocket type of exhaust, but the witnesses didn't hear anything. Now, you might want to at first categorize that as one of those weird UFO displays uh, wherein it, it is silent. The UFO that I and the other witness at my house um, saw in December of 2014 was silent. I mean, no noise emanating from it at all. And also, I couldn't tell you what ambient noise was going on. We were so focused on the object. But before classifying it as one of those strange UFOs that um, th that displays an action that should come with sound but doesn't, there's the issue, uh, you know, with um, my friend's mom's sighting, there's the issue of he and his dad heard sound and, and felt the, uh, the effects of that sound without seeing the object. So is there something about being within visual range of one of these objects that allows whoever on board to um, block uh, the audio, as it were. I mean, you would think a fiery exhaust would make some type of chemical burning sound, right? I don't know. Um, I would think. But, you know, here's a, here's a case of a thing with a fiery rocket coming out of one end and no noise. Let me find another one here that I highlighted. Oh, here's a little bit about a Damsky. Uh, let's jump over to that. Like I said, for those of you who are just logging on, this is the Saturday live stream, and we're doing a little potpourri. I'm pulling uh, interesting things out of this book, Andromeda, the um, Andromeda, the Secret Files, the Flying Submarines of the SS. And in this particular chapter, it talks about George Adamski. George Adamski and the Venusians. Adamski and the Venusians is a curious tale. Adamski was born in Bromberg in the Kingdom of Prussia, German Empire, in 1862. He was one of five siblings born to ethnic Polish parents who immigrated... 1862? Okay. He was one of five siblings born to ethnic Polish parents who immigrated to the United States when he was two years old, settling in New York City. From 1913 to 1916, beginning at the age of 22, he was a soldier in the 13th U.S. Cavalry Regiment, K Troop, fighting at the Mexican border during the Pancho Villa Expedition. George Adamski sounds like, uh, you know, um, the, the beginning of an adventure hero there, right? You know Edgar Rice Burroughs, my friends. Uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs author of the, the tales in this, which you can get, uh, I don't know if this is at walterbosley.com, but it is at lulu.com. Um, he started out in the U.S. Cavalry in the 19th century in Arizona. Think about that the next time you read John Carter of Mars. In 1917, Adamski married Mary Shimbersky, and they moved out west. Adamski did maintenance work in Yellowstone National Park, there's a Montana connection, and worked in, Oregon, in an Oregon flour mill and a California concrete factory. 1920s, Adamski was living in Southern California and became interested in theosophy. Oh, a branch of the Theosophical Association, founded by Helena Blavatsky, had split off from the original Theosophical group and had relocated to the Los Angeles area and then to La Jolla in the San Diego area. It was popular in the 1920s and 30s, and Adamski took interest in this and became a minor figure on the California occult scene. Ooh, the California occult scene. Teaching his personal mixture of Christianity and Eastern religions, which he called the universal progressive Christianity and universal law. Adamski then founded his own religious order, called the Royal Order of Tibet, 
You guys know what I think of them fellows who go off and start their own religious orders. You know, we talk about that here. Uh, in the early, uh, says Wikipedia, in the early 1930s, while living in Southern California, Adamski founded the Royal Order of Tibet in Laguna Beach, which held its meetings in the Temple of Scientific Philosophy. Adamski served as a philosopher and teacher at the temple. The Royal Order of Tibet was given a government license to make wine for religious purposes during Prohibition. Adamski was quoted as saying, I made enough wine for all of Southern California. I was making a fortune. <laughs> oh, there's a new angle for starting your own church. However, the end of Prohibition in 1933 also marked the decline of his profitable winemaking business, and Adamski later told two friends that that's when he had to get into this flying saucer crap. Let me repeat that Adamski quote. Now, this is George Adamski, legendary contactee. The end of Prohibition in 1933 also marked the decline of his profitable winemaking business. And Adamski later told two friends that's when he, this is the quote, had to get into this flying saucer crap. Kind of sounds like what, you know, Wilcock and... And uh, Lou Elizondo and Corey Good and and all of them, you know, they they had to get into this flying saucer crap, right? Because other things weren't so lucrative. Reading on. In 1940, Adamski, his wife, and some close friends moved to a ranch near California's Palomar Mountain. Palomar Mountain, very popular uh, ritualistic site, we have learned in recent times, right? where they dedicated their time to studying religion, philosophy, and farming. The Adamskis had no children, but instead gathered something of a commune around them, including some who were wealthy. How convenient. One of these wealthy students of Adamski and his Royal Order of Tibet was a widow named Alice K. Wells. With her help, the Adamskis purchased 20 acres of land at the base of Palomar Mountain, where they built a new home, a campground called Palomar Gardens, and a small diner called Palomar Gardens Cafe. At the campground and diner, Adamski often gave lectures on Eastern philosophy and religion, sometimes late into the night. He built a wooden observatory at the campground to house his six-inch telescope, and visitors and tourists to Palomar Mountain often had the false impression that so-called Professor Adamski was connected to the famous Palomar Observatory, an impression he did little to avoid. Then, on October 9, 1946, during a meteor shower, Adamski and a group of friends claimed that while they were at the Palomar Gardens campground, they witnessed a large cigar-shaped mothership. A few months later, in early 1947, Adamski claimed he took a photograph of the same cigar-shaped mothership crossing in front of the moon above Palomar Gardens. Then, in the summer of 1947, following the first widely publicized UFO sightings in the U.S., Adamski claimed he had seen as many as 184 UFOs pass over Palomar Gardens during one evening. 184. That's quite a wave. Adamski, like all theosophists, believed in reincarnation, ancient masters and adepts, secret brotherhoods, Atlantis, plus the notion that all planets had life on them, whether on this physical plane or on another subtler plane. The Swedish mystic Emanuel Swedenborg proposed much the same notion that all the planets were inhabited on one plane of existence or another. In 1949, Adamski changed his lectures from being primarily about Tibetan and Eastern mysticism to lectures that were more about UFOs, extraterrestrials, and life on other planets. Because as he said, he had to get into this flying saucer crap, right? It's his words. Hey, true believers, it's your own hero's words, okay? One of the legendary contactees, his words. He called it the flying saucer crap. Don't blame me. 
during da, 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 oh he began selling his single photo of a cigar shaped craft over Palomar Gardens and his booklet on the Royal Order of Tibet. During these lectures, he made fantastic claims, such as that government and science had established the existence of UFOs two years earlier via radar tracking of 700-foot-long spacecraft on the other side of the moon. The diction, the grammar and the diction and all that here implies that there were multiple of these 700-feet-long craft on the other side of the moon. He also claimed that science now knows that all planets in Earth's solar system are inhabited. All planets in Earth's solar system are inhabited. Hmm. And photos of Mars taken from the Mount Palomar Observatory have proven that the canals on Mars are man-made, built by an intelligence far greater than any man's on Earth. That's what Adamski taught. Uh, mm, 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 mm. On May, uh, oh, let's see, while most people in the UFO craze of the late 1940s were speculating that the flying saucers and cigar-shaped craft were coming from Mars, Adamski promoted Venus as a planet that was inhabited, and the source of the unusual flying craft being seen in the late 1940s in California and elsewhere. On May 29, 1950, Adamski claims he took a photograph of five glowing disc craft around a cigar-shaped mothership similar to the Andromeda craft, which David talks about in the rest of this book. Adamski immediately began selling this photograph at his lectures. Adamski then took four photos of a cylindrical craft hovering near Mount Palomar on March 5, 1951, at 10.30 in the morning. The craft starts putting out smaller glowing disks in the series of four photographs. The last photo shows the dark elongated craft with six glowing fi flying saucers around it. Adamski copyrighted these photos and began to sell them at his lectures. These photos seem pretty authentic. And it may be that Adamski genuinely took these photos as he claimed, although such an incident would have had to have been staged so that he could get such perfect photos. Staged. A UFO photo staged? Oh, why, I never. The year 1952 was a big one for Adamski, and he claimed that on November 20th of that year, he and several friends, including the soon-to-be-famous writer George Hunt Williamson, remember I was talking about Walter Siegmeister a couple days ago? and how he lifted certain things, uh, or, or he talked about being in contact with the same aliens uh, talked about by George Hunt Williamson in one of his books. That's the same guy, George Hunt Williamson. And that was, um, George Hunt Williamson was one of Adamski's friends. Okay, uh, he and friends, including Williamson, witnessed a submarine-shaped UFO hovering over the desert north of the town of Blythe, California, on Highway 95. Now, um, uh, if you've ever been out to Blythe, there's the famous Intaglios. It's an ancient um, image of a um, kind of a stick figure male done, like I said, in ancient times, kind of laid out on the ground there. You can go visit it. Malia and I just went there um, last summer, last spring, I think. Anyway, um, Blythe is about, I want to say, three hours from here. Um, so uh, that's interesting that they saw a submarine-shaped UFO out by Blythe. Now, that's where the Colorado River is, too, by the way. It's more of their sign craft of Mark of the California... I'm trying to get to, um, it is like David writes, it is a desert area with few inhabitants the farther you uh, go into the desert. Adamski and his small group said they saw a large cigar-shaped object hovering in the sky to the west, believing that the ship was looking for him. Adamski is said to have left his friends and to have headed away from the main road. Shortly afterward, Adamski claims a scout ship landed in the desert near him, and the sole occupant of this discoid craft came out and told Adamski through sign language and telepathy that his name was Orthon, and he was from Venus. Orthon, 
also indicated that he and other Venusians were worried about nuclear war and its adverse effects on planet Earth. There we go again. The other witnesses later stated they could see Adamski meeting someone in the desert, although from a considerable distance. I guess they saw him from a considerable distance. He wasn't meeting with someone at a considerable distance from that person he was meeting with. These testimonies have been doubted and retracted over the years. It seems that Adamski walked over a desert hill and disappeared for a short time and then returned with his tale of meeting Orthon. No one actually saw him meet anyone. They had, however, apparently all seen the submarine-shaped elongated craft in the sky sometime previously that day. Adamski said that this was the craft in the photos taken previously on March 5, 1951. Adamski described Orthon as being a medium-height humanoid with long blonde hair and tanned skin and wearing reddish-brown shoes, though, as Adamski added, his trousers were not like mine. Why would, why would you remember his shoes? Reddish-brown shoes. What, what's that? Isn't there a color it begins with C? I mean, I I've had one or two pair of shoes this color. Core core something. Um you know, maybe the guy, you know, just had a snappy taste in sh in footwear. <laughs> Reddish brown shoes. Okay. Maybe he was from Oz. And he clicked his heels together three times and said, there's no place like home. And his trousers were not like Adamski's because here, here's the thing. What's important about that is to remember that everybody, you know, must have worn trousers like Adamski for him to note that this fellow, Orth Orthon of Venus, was not wearing trousers like his. I mean... Was he wearing them with suspenders or was he wearing those, those, uh, trousers slacks with the buckle strap in the back? Um, who knows? Were they jeans? Was he wearing, was Orthon wearing jeans in his reddish brown shoes? I don't know. Uh oh. Who knows? Um, during the conversation, Orthon purportedly warned of the dangers of nuclear war. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, space brother, space brother, peace, peace, peace message. After Orthon left, he allegedly left shoe imprints of which a plaster cast was made. The imprints contained mysterious symbols such as the swastika or sun wheel, which Adamski said was a message from Orthon. Now remember, he did start the Royal Order of Tibet and the swastika, various variations, various versions of it. Is that redundant? Um, you know, aside, it, it, it still was a symbol of theirs. This whole alleged contact was said to have taken place on November 20th, 1952, and uh, Adamski claimed that Orthon of Venus met him at the campground at Palomar Gardens on another occasion. And there were still swastikas on this stuff that the guy was giving him. It was during this meeting that Adamski is said to have taken the now famous photographs of Orthon's Venusian scout ship. Um... This leads to, let's see, about this time, an Anglo-Irish eccentric named Desmond Leslie struck up a correspondence with Adamski. In need of money and keen to create a bestseller, Leslie had written a manuscript about the visitation of Earth by aliens. Adamski sent Leslie his photos and a written account of his own supposed contact with Orthon. Leslie combined the two works into the 1953 co-authored Flying Saucers Have Landed. The book became a bestseller and brought both Adamski and Leslie news media attention. Many consider the book a key text of the New Age movement. 
you don't say. Um, now, here is a drawing of the saucer that Adamski, the famous Adamski saucer. Look closely at the details of that, okay? And let me go back, because there's a Damsky with a photo of it right there. See that? In the photo, you can see the bottom, the round part of the saucer with the three globes. Okay, now folks, that photo is a lie. It, it's a hoax. Um, that Adamski saucer has been proven, demonstrated, to have been a photograph of um, a, a Coleman camping lantern shroud. Okay, look it up. Vintage Coleman camp lantern shroud. Okay, and you will see. All right, the I believe the original version of it is identical, identical to the Adamski. I mean identical, okay, in the truest sense of the word. Um, this this is the problem we have in uh, in UFO land is people still want to believe in a guy that said, well. You know, essentially, I need to make some money, so I better get into this flying saucer crap. Okay. Um, so, what are we to make of his stories of the mothership sightings? Um, okay. And these UFOs and such. Um, how does it reflect on sightings with? You know, other photos or or people who seem to be um, uh, credible seeing the same things. Well, this is why you don't believe every UFO claim, okay? Because not everyone is going to be legit. Adamski, George Adamski, his wine, his his fake church winemaking business was beginning to, you know, falter. So he had to come up with some new scam. And he decided to, in his own words, get into this flying saucer crap. And there you go. He faked, hoaxed that ship. That, 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 that classic Venusian Adamski flying saucer was never real, folks. Oh, it was a real uh, Coleman Camp Lantern uh, shroud. But it was never a flying saucer from Venus. It was never a Hanabu. Because the Hanabu didn't exist. Ernst Zundel. There's a name you can start with. And these alleged photos that um, you know show the alleged Hanabu in flight. And they, all, they look official. And, and uh, like they're really from some secret file. No. Those did not emerge until well beyond World War II in an era in which uh, what we call Photoshopping had become already much easier to create fakes with, okay? Um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the, the photos in question that I'm mentioning, you guys, many of you have seen them, the um, uh, alleged secret file captured Nazi file photos of the, the uh, supposed Hanabu in flight, um, high altitude. Those didn't emerge until I, I think the 1980s. Okay. Um, so you, if those had emerged in the 1950s, you could say, Oh, well, okay. It's the decade after the end of world war two. Maybe we should consider it. Um, but no, they emerged in the 1980s. And there is absolutely no evidence nor reason 
to suspect that they could be real or true. Okay. Other than you just want to believe that. Um, I was going to do another potpourri, you know, jump over to, um, anyway, uh, seriously though, um, check out David's books on this stuff. Cause like I said, he doesn't tell you what to conclude. He doesn't tell you what to think. He does, um, a comprehensive presentation on the legend and the stories and, uh, relative tales, um, in his books. And they, they're worth, if you're into this stuff, they're worth having, even if, you know, the stuff in it serves to disprove, you know, what, what's being talked about. Now, when I finish this book, um, I will be talking more about it. Uh, so look for, look for me to talk about this in the near future. Now we come back to Lost Continents and the Hollow Earth by David Childress, including work um, on Richard Shaver. This is not David Childress Day. I just happen to be uh, talking about um, stuff that he's written books about. Let me see. Let me pick something out here. The Underground World of Central Asia. God's Beasts and the Underground World of Agarda. My search for the subterranean world ultimately took me around the world. From South and Central America to India, Nepal, China, and Tibet. From my base at the World Explorers Club in Kathmandu, I traveled by bus and truck over the Himalayas to Lhasa and Shigatse in Tibet. At the Pilgrim's Bookstore in Kathmandu, I had purchased a number of old books on Mongolia, Tibet, and China as part of my research on the legendary underground world of Central Asia. My research in Kathmandu... Do, Kathmandu... <laughs> my research in Kathmandu... Oh, darn it. Sorry. Um, my research in Kathmandu and Lhasa showed that there was a great deal of material on the subject of subterranean tunnels, underground cities, and the various masters of the world. Tales of these mysterious groups and places are contradictory as well as bizarre. There was mention of the abode of the immortals in western Tibet, said to be the headquarters of the Great White Brotherhood, the sacred city of Shambhala in the Gobi Desert, and the underground university of Agartha in Mongolia, where they study mining. Northern Tibet, or on the border of Nepal and southeastern Tibet. One of the first books to discuss the bizarre legendary underground world of Central Asia was Beasts, Men, and Gods by the Polish scientist Ferdinand Osendowski. Osendowski had lived most of his life in Russia and had attended the University of St. Petersburg. In the 1890s, he traveled east through Siberia into Mongolia and western China for several years and was in awe of the rugged wilderness and mystic Buddhism of these areas. He returned to Europe at the turn of the century and earned a doctorate in Paris in 1903. He left again for Russia, where he became a chemical expert for the Russian army during the Russo-Japanese War of 1905. Shortly afterward, he became president of the short-lived revolutionary government of the Russian Far East. He was taken a political prisoner by the Russian government for his activities against the Tsarist re regime. Uh, let's see, after his release from prison, he lived in Omsk in Siberia, teaching physics and chemistry when the Bolshevik Revolution exploded across Russia. Uh, let's see, Osendowski, um, let's see. Okay, he starts traveling across Siberia and into Mongolia. Osendowski and his group then crossed into China from whence he made his way back to Europe. Okay, so he's out there traveling around. You got his background there. And he writes a book about it, Men, Beasts, and Gods, the aforementioned title. In the last section of the book, Osendowski writes about the mystery of mysteries, the king of the world. That's that Rex Mundi guy I was talking about the other day. And the subterranean kingdom. These are names of the chapters in, in 
topics in his book, says Ossendowski, on my journey into Central Asia, I came to know for the first time about the mystery of mysteries, which I can call by no other name. At the outset, I did not pay much attention to it and did not attach to it such importance as I afterwards realized belonged to it when I had analyzed and connoted many sporadic, hazy, and often controversial bits of evidence. The old people on the shore of the river Emil related to me an ancient legend to the effect that a certain Mongolian tribe in their escape from the demands of the Genghis Khan hid themselves in a subterranean country. Afterwards, a Soyut from near the lake of Nogunkul showed me the smoking gate that serves as the entrance to the kingdom of Agardi, the smoking gate. Through this gate, a hunter formerly entered the kingdom and after his return, began to relate what he had seen there. The lamas cut out his tongue in order to prevent him from telling about the mystery of mysteries. When he arrived at old age, he came back to the entrance of this cave and disappeared into the subterranean kingdom, the memory of which had ornamented and lightened his nomad heart. Ossendowski adds, I received more realistic information about this from Hutuktu Jelib Jamsrap in Narabanki Kure. He told me the story of the semi-realistic arrival of the powerful king of the world from the subterranean kingdom, of his appearance, of his miracles, and of his prophecies. And only then did I begin to understand that in that legend, hypnosis or mass vision, whichever it may be, is hidden not only mystery, but a realistic and powerful force capable of influencing the course of the political life of Asia. From that moment... I began making some investigations. One of Ossendowski's informants told him, more than 60,000 years ago, a holy man disappeared with a whole tribe of people under the ground and never appeared again on the surface of the earth. Many people, however, have since visited this kingdom. Sakya Muni, Undur Gegen, Paspa, Khan Baber, and others. No one knows where this place is. One says Afghanistan, others say India. All the people there are protected against evil and crimes do not exist within its boundaries. Where am I? Science has there developed calmly, and nothing is threatened with destruction. The subterranean people have reached the highest knowledge. There's irony in that, right? The subterranean people have reached the highest knowledge. Now it is a large kingdom, millions of men, with the king of the world as their ruler. He knows all the forces of the world and reads all the souls of humankind in the great book of their destiny. Invisibly, he rules 800 million men on the surface of the earth, and they will accomplish his every order. This sounds like something out of... Oh, I don't have it here. Remember I read to you Talbot Mundy, right? Sounds like almost the nine, the secret leader with his secret command over his operatives who will, who will accomplish his every order. One of Ossendowski's informants, Prince Chultan Bailey, added, This kingdom is a Garty. It extends throughout all subterranean passages of the whole world. I heard a learned lama of China relating to Bagdo Khan that all the subterranean caves of America are inhabited by the ancient people who have disappeared underground. Traces of them are still found on the surface of the land. These subterranean peoples and spaces are governed by rulers owing allegiance to the king of the world. In it, there is much of the wonderful. You know that in the two greatest oceans of the East and the West, there were formerly two continents. They disappeared under the water, but their people went into the subterranean kingdom. In underground caves, there exists a peculiar light, which affords growth to the grains and vegetables and long life without disease to the people. There are many different peoples and many different tribes. Here, Ossendowski has touched the familiar themes of lost continents and a super-civilization living within the bowels of the earth. One can see where Richard Shaver and Ray Palmer, who I talked about a few nights ago, could have gleaned some inspiration for their tales. Another of Ossendowski's informants, the Lama Turgut, who traveled with Ossendowski's group, 
told him, the capital of Agardi is surrounded with towns of high priests and scientists. Okay. Let me see. So that's, um, that goes on and on with Ossendowski. Check out Ossendowski's book, Man, Beast, and Gods. Okay. And you can read more about what he's talking about there. Let me get to, what's this here? What's this here? This is the thing I read the other night there. So I've, I've already covered that, but, um, Again, this is a really fun book. You guys should get it. You can get it at AUP. There's the title, Lost Continents in the Hollow Earth, David Hatcher Childress. Now, it's the one that's co-credited to Richard Shaver. Okay. Now, um, I also pulled off the shelf one of my, well, my favorite Bruce Ruck's book, and that's Architects of the Underworld, uh, Unriddling Atlantis, Anomalies of Mars, and the Mystery of the Sphinx. And you can see how much I have referred to this book by all my little tabs. Let's see. Let's, uh, let's pick something here. Let's pick something here. Shall we tell you what? Let us see. Let us see. Let's jump over to, um, or jump down from here to uh, Mexico. Yeah, I think I've read this thing before. So um, I'm going to go to questions. So if you have any questions, this is kind of one of those days where, um, you know, nothing, uh, nothing specific. Um, Wanted to kind of um, share with you some things I'd been looking at in my books and perhaps hadn't talked uh, completely about. I'm going to uh, go to the live chat now and take your questions on anything. Ask me a question, not just on the, the, the little bits and tidbits and potpourri that I shared with you. You know, um, ask me uh, you know, a question about anything. And uh, we'll do we'll do this for a while. We don't have a strict uh, um, end time tonight. So, all caps. Thank you, Johnny Side. That's right. As Johnny Side reminds you all, please all caps. If you want me to acknowledge a comment or answer a question, this is one of those. Uh, and that's right. All topics. Ask me if I don't have an answer or know an answer. Okay, that's the answer you'll get. But it can be an opinion question. It can be on something that I've talked about in the past and presented recently. Um, you know. It can be about any of the books. Now, there's my time travel book. If you haven't read it, I will see you in time. That's definitely available. That I believe at uh, WalterBosley.com. And and this, this is a good book. Read it. Read it. Do it. Do it. If you like time travel stories, and you guys know me, I tell you, don't ignore the fiction because I put stuff from my research that I don't put in the nonfiction will often land in the fiction. So you know. Ignored at your own peril. Wonder of the Worlds, hardcover. First hardcover from my company. So here we go. Question one from Johnny Side. Have you tried CW Chanter, Nostalgia Loop, Time Travel, or will you? Um, I, I tried it. Uh, yeah. Um, experienced it, certainly, for quite a number of years. One of the reasons that I like it and think there's something to it is because it does resonate with things I've researched and studied and thought and experienced. 
Um, I actually do a form of C.W. Chanter's nostalgia loop uh, time travel um, method just about every night because I listen to th those Nemo's Dreamscape uh, audio videos on YouTube. Um, I listen to those as I, you know, we listen to that when we sleep. And, um, and of course, when I'm not here, I listen to it as well at home. And um, it really, it has an eerie effect. I think I might have mentioned it on um, when I was on another show recently. Um, it, it, it has this weird, eerie effect that it, it kind of like reaching across time, so to speak. So I, I'm telling you, I think that there is something worth trying for all of you with C.W. Channer's method. So go back and, and watch that episode from a couple Wednesdays ago, and I think you'll find it interesting. And then go watch CW's videos on them, on the uh, Nostalgia Time Loops, if he has them posted still. ModWiz125, welcome ModWiz, nice seeing you again. ModWiz says, I think many of the craft we see are otherworldly from the other older world that lives in the earth. Uh, see, I like that, and I'm, just as, if not more inclined to think that that's the other world that they come from. I, I like that. I agree with you on that, ModWiz. That should not be ignored. The the ET hypothesis people, uh, you know, enough is enough, okay? You've dominated the damn conversation for decades, and yet your pet theory, uh, there, there's no way it answers more than a sliver of legitimate UFO sightings, Okay. So I know you love it. I know you believe every goddamn source that comes down the pike that says it's extraterrestrial because it's your favorite. Okay. Um, but, you know, uh, it's time other ideas got heard and are taken seriously. And, um, you know, it's just long overdue. The answer, the, the, there is no one answer, and that one answer, even if E.T. is not it on either count, okay? E.T. explains some of them, yes, of course. Paul 1, Walter Bosley, will you be having Dr. Farrell back anytime soon for continuation of your transtemporal topic? Yes, Paul 1. Um I get asked that a lot, and I will say again, uh, Joseph Farrell being on the show is entirely driven by his availability, um, which is greatly hindered at times by the weather. Joseph has wanted to be on um, in the last month, but weather prohibited it. So, um, yeah, the answer for me is yes. Um, as far as anytime soon, you got to ask him. Uh, about the weather issue, okay? But as soon as he can, we'll have him back. Philip Blair, if you were to make one, have you ever thought what your pretend religion would entail? Would you pick a mountain like the Adamski types do? Um, my religion wouldn't make much money and probably wouldn't have many members because it would prohibit... Uh, proselytizing. It would prohibit evangelizing. And it wouldn't require people give money weekly or tithing or, or, or at all. It would be a way of life. It would be a, a philosophy that the individual can practice or groups could, you know, enjoy hanging out together, talking about it and thinking about it. But it would not be the model that we've had um, in the West, and particularly in the United States, you know, the churchianity type of model. No. Leandra Goldman. 
asks, Walter, what was your opinion on the new Napoleon movie? Uh, disappointment. Production values were excellent. Um, it, it nowhere near told the amount of the story that it should have. It unfortunately kowtowed to the Napoleon was a megalomaniac weirdo line of crap. In other words, British propaganda. Br let me, British oligarchy, British academic propaganda. Because remember, even in those days, what what the crown and what London, city of London, were afraid of was that the that they were afraid that their own people would just love Napoleon, because they were, you know, there were there were expressions of excitement when they everybody thought he was going to be banished to the north of England. That scared the hell out of the crown and the city of London. So at the last minute, they decided, oh no, we'll put him on the island. You know, it, it's. Yeah, uh, it's yeah. It should have been uh, that movie should have only been titled Napoleon and Josephine because it was it was indeed pretty accurate to their relationship. I mean, he wrote them dirty letters to her, and they did get published. Um, he he and her did have this, um, you know, connection and obsessive lust for each other. I mean that that was a fact. So if 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 they would have just titled it Napoleon and Josephine, it would have come across as a better film for me. But um, huge disappointment. Huge disappointment. And I also got the feeling that they're... Well, I, I'm sorry, got the feeling. Um, Ridley Scott indicated that, you know, that uh, there was much more film than what we saw. So oddly enough, the editing shows it pretty drastically. You, I came away feeling like there was a lot more to this movie that we didn't get to see. D. Dorothy Papineau, how about the owls and the UFOs you've experienced? Well, um, I was just talking about this. Um, if you look at the live stream from last night, I pretty much said what happened. Um, you know, the scream, the running out there, the owl sitting on top of the tree. I ran in, got the camera. It stayed there long enough for me to come out and get some good footage of it. And then it spread its wings slowly and majestically and then gently, you know, launched off of the top of the tree and that was it you know and then the other experience i told you about was the one where um it was perched up on the light pole the horizontal part of the light pole and um apparently you know i had that experience after kind of putting it out there to the two at adita nance like hey if you're if you're still out there show me a sign and that's what they showed me. Ralph Ring. Sidvich. Are they coming on audio cassette soon? Um, no, not soon. And um, I do, that reminds me, I do have, uh, we are working on the uh, audio books. We are working through those. Pretty soon there's going to be about uh, three or four titles available. Tess 1111, uh, was something going on in Hollywood during the 1950s? Yeah, a lot of movies were being made, and there was the Red Scare stuff, which Hollywood did to itself. Um, you mean as far as to explain UFO sightings? Well, there was that, if you read Strange, what is it, Strange Tales in Laurel Canyon. I have that right here. I know I have that book. That's in the other room. Um, there was that studio, that secret studio the government had that was uh, tucked away in Laurel Canyon. And they, they had more facilities, more resources, and made more movies than Hollywood's total... Um, total uh, uh, amount of production for a long time. I mean, it was weird. So maybe they were doing stuff, but um, I don't know. Joey Charlie, what is the certain way to read the Iliad and Odyssey to awaken certain aspects? Um, I, it's, it's, a, it's a little more involved for me to go into here. 
but it does involve the order in which you actually read the books and how you break them down and read them. And it is a process that takes one, two, three, four, like six months or so. Mike does says they come and go more than one home. Okay. Yeah. Mike does says earth Nibiru. Okay. Mike does says star system Kachina is close. Okay. Megalithic yard. We should call the underground older society craft and occupants the OT hypothesis. Other terrestrials. Okay, yeah. Yeah, the OT hypothesis. I like that. I like that. The reason you get the ET hypothesis people so bunched up in their panties is because, you know, they dominate the media. They dominate the movies and the TV shows about this. Um, uh, there's there's money at stake. I That is the primary reason the ET hypothesis um, kind of looks down and puts down other possibilities and wants to keep them down is because of the money involved. If, look, there's not billions to be made in ufology and UFOs and stuff, but the, of the money that there is to be made, the ET hypothesis clearly makes the most and they want to make it all. Okay. And then you have their true believer followers who, um, are just that true believers that tells you everything you need to know about them. They're going to believe everything they hear because that's what they, that's the hypothesis, the, the hypothesis that they want to be true. But the people, um, I, I think, and this is, this is opinion. I think that the, the people behind the ET hypothesis crowd reaction to other possibilities, um, when it's when it's a negative reaction or a disdainful or dismissive reaction, I think if you look deep enough, what you'll find is one or more persons in there acting on behalf of those with financial interest in the ET hypothesis domination. Okay, um, I really think that's the primary force behind the ET hypothesis domination. Is you know. The people have, you know, either produced films about that or they've got TV shows or the books, you know, again, I'm not like some people out there who condemns everybody because they, they, they probably got a book to sell. Um, I have books to sell. I am a publisher and an author. Um, the writing of a book, you know, that's how you get your information out there. And of course, you want to sell that book. Um, selling the books allows you to augment or, God willing, make enough of an income just on that to where you can keep writing the books and keep doing the research. Are there people who lie in books? Yes, all the time. Well, buyer beware, you know. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, um, the, the, the people that have a stake in the ET hypothesis, you know, they don't want to, I mean, think about Roswell, New Mexico, the town. Okay. If you've been there, you know that there's, uh, alien ET UFO gift shops everywhere there. Okay. Now, if suddenly there was the hypothesis, you know, um, the, uh, ultra terrestrial or inner earth or other terrestrial as megalithic yard has proposed a hypothesis were to were to get a piece an equal piece of attention or um, become the dominant hypothesis those people would have to then go invest in other tchotchkes and t-shirt stuff to sell right they don't want to do that there a lot of it is you know um, small businesses family owned you know, and, and they've uh, invested in these objects, these items, this merchandise, because, you know, it'll sell when tourists come to their town. So there's tourism dollars involved in this as well. 
Um, yeah, the ET hypothesis, it, it's just interesting how for what a little slice of explanation it offers for the phenomenon, um, it it really has a, an incongruent dominance um, in this community. Walter, can you speak on the helium embargo? Any recent developments on dirigible versus solar? Do you have any ideas for our magnetic floating on the government calls? Okay, slick dissident. Um, any any topic within reason. I, I don't follow helium. I don't follow. Uh, it, come on, no, um, I can't speak on that. Thank you for your question, though. Mike does says Napoleon was globalist. No, Napoleon was not a globalist. I disagree with you on that. Mick Connolly, could you expand on your Athena as inner earth watcher? No, I, no, Athena, in my opinion, is an aspect of Hecate. And um, as, as far as inner earth, land of the dead is generally a different place than than inner earth as we we talk about it here um now when you look at the odyssey and um odysseus goes to the land of the dead and he goes into a literal subterranean place to speak to the dead where he has to dig the pit one cubit square and cut the throat of the goat and fill it with the warm blood so that they, the dead, can come forth and drink it. Remember, he has to hold the sword. He has to draw his sword and hold the dead at bay. They are not allowed to drink the fresh blood until they've answered his questions. It's very frightening. It's a very, it's very scary. It's uh, my gosh, it's my favorite chapter in the whole saga. I stole it shamelessly for a scene in my secret of the Amazon queen novel. Um, isn't that interesting that Homer tells us about that, that the dead in this subterranean place are blood drinkers. Anyway, um, Hecate is connected to the underworld. Athena, traditionally not. Um, the, yeah, yeah. The watcher aspect, I'll jump over to that. Um, the watcher aspect, uh, that would be um, going back to, well, the origin of the Chthonic gods and goddesses. Now, um, Hecate is one of the Chthonic goddesses. What does that mean? That gen the, these are the ones that are so old that their origin, their, their true origin is um, unknown. Okay? It's older than all the uh, known... Um, pantheons, is that right? Yeah. Of the gods um, in any other culture. You know, Hecate, uh, she and her peers are older than even, you know, the ancient Egyptian pantheon. Okay. Isis, the Egyptian goddess Isis, the veiled Isis, is another aspect of Hecate. So, um, as, uh, as we've heard that the, you know, a couple of sources, um, that the abode of the dead is a place between the earth and the moon. We also have this idea of the, the subterranean underworld on this planet being an abode of the dead. Well, could it be that the idea of heaven and hell 
which by the way, the, the traditional ideas of heaven and hell that we in the West and America here are all taught at Sunday school, you know, um, that, you know, the good, the good people go to heaven and the bad ones go to hell. You know, the good ones go up, the bad ones go down. Could the origin of, of that myth, those myths, uh, actually be this idea that some of the dead exist in this plane that is found between heaven and the moon, or sorry, found between earth and the moon. Okay. Could that be where souls unburdened, um, go to that that realm between the earth and the moon? Could it be that the souls that are burdened with either bad karma or, or, or um, not willing to let go of the notion that they are a so-called sinful creature until they, you know, suffer an appropriate amount of time before they just let that shit go? Um, could it be that those go into the subterranean realms of the earth? And could that be where we get the idea of the good people go up and the bad people go down? Because think about it. The, uh, the dead, as they're described in Homer, in the Odyssey, this is not a place you want to be. This is not a condition you want to be in. You don't want to be crawling through the, the grimy sand of the dark underworld, you know, to, to get your, your, you know, gulps of of blood you know that's just gurgled out of the throat of a goat into this pit in the ground that that doesn't sound like anything like heaven to me so um could homer have been writing about blood drinkers even that are below the surface remember i told you um the other night you know, my uncle my mentor had told me stay the hell out of the caves you know, so I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, so um, it sounds very much like a place that from if, if you take only the dark folkloric, um, uh, you know, she's the goddess of the witchcraft um, view of Hecate, the Homerian underworld, uh, land of the dead, you know, sounds like that spooky, creepy Hecate that um, so many people who really don't know the first thing about Hecate um, believe about her and, and limit her to that. So um, if she's a watcher, I think the, I think what you will find in the watcher lore is a hint of those beings who came from elsewhere that helped create us perhaps, um, you know, and there was a division between the two. The ones who helped us were condemned by the ones who just wanted to keep enslaving us. Um, I don't see Hecate as one of the uh, enslavers. I see Hecate much like I see Athena in that she is a helper. So... I hope that gives some type of answer. Hi, Walter. Uh, this is Todor Kolev. Hi, Walter. Your opinion over Napoleon is shaped from most of the Europe over here with Hegel ahead. Oh, okay, good. Philip Blair. I have a Coleman lamp keychain light. Same shape there, just smaller. Have you ever seen those? They come out every right before the winter holidays and Christmas. I, I don't think I've seen those, but if I do, I'm going to get one because that's funny. It, they are the same shape because it's the same thing. Folks, folks, George Adamski faked that photo with a Coleman lantern shroud. Okay, period. Like it or not. Like it or not. Some people will continue to go on in denial. Uh... Leandra Goldman, Walter, what is your take on what happened in Moscow with the shooting and all? I, I did did some shooting happen recently or today? I, you guys, believe it or not, I don't sit there watching the news all day. I, I apologize, you know, I'm not trying to be rude to Leandra, but I, I just it can just be 
Um, g- give me a little more context, Leandra, because you're talking about an event that I'm not aware of. Mike does. Yes, um, other terrestrials, but the other terrestrials have many planets that come home. Well, yeah. No one, no one's disputing that, Mike. Not at all. Uh, Mick Connolly, any linguistics angle to inner earth? Oh, do you have like a week to talk about that? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. There's, you're going to find that. Johnny side. Have you watched the new Netflix series, three body problem or read the book? I've not read the book. And I just today, thank you for asking about that. Johnny side. I just today saw like a, uh, a little promo on TikTok. And if you believe TikTok is a national security threat to the United States, you might be what we call a goddamned idiot. But I'll uh, move on to the next subject. I'm not saying, I'm not aiming that at you, Johnny Side. That was a rhetorical statement. Mike does. There is more land on Earth. There, uh, Okay. I've heard that. Philip Blair searched this to see an influential ETH cartoon from 1956, Old Industry Propaganda Destination Earth. Yep, there we go. Fun movie. ModWiz 125. The ET hypothesis is convenient to direct away from another more plausible hypothesis, of course. The money is icing on the cake. Well, that's how the ET hypothesis is, is certainly used by some parties, yes. But... The, the useful idiots for those. Okay, there's the diverters, okay? And the useful idiots of the diverters are the people that are in it for the money. That's how I'll put it. Uh, Mike does. Napoleon was the founder of the continental system, globalism. I, You know, um, okay, maybe, maybe textbook-wise, the continental system is supposedly supposed to be the root of globalism, but Napoleon was not a globalist, is what I'm trying to say. And I really doubt that he set up his continental system with globalism as we understand it today in mind. Okay, so that's, there you go. Um, I, I, I'm disagreeing with you on the finer points of of that. Dee Dee, Dorothy Papineau, can you get Seshery on soon? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm working on that. Definitely working on that, D. Dorothy. Uh, ModWiz 125, one could see a parallel story of the Titans and Olympians, with the other worlders being the older Titan types isolated in Tartarus, the underworld. Oh, okay. I like that. Okay. Do, do, do. Okay. Olive Eisner asks Walter, when are you appearing on the Dark Journalist podcast? He mentioned it last week. We, uh, we haven't worked out the date yet, but um, it should be fairly soon. Philip Blair asks, which caves was your uncle, were your uncle, which caves were your, was your uncle? Hmm. Which caves, which cave was your uncle referring to? Specifically, when he told you, he, he just meant stay out of the caves in general, Philip. I, I had uh, been talking to him about Carlsbad Caverns and the stuff there. And then I was just talking generally about all the caverns. And he said in a general way, stay the hell out of them. Mod was 125 with Athena's goodness gave Zeus a headache. <laughs> oh, I get it. I get it. Very good one, Mod was. Those of you who get it will get it. If you know, you know. Johnny side. Hecate Freya connection. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
I got to look more at the Freya connection. I do. JT88 says, long live the new flesh. D. Dorothy Papineau, ISIS claims they are responsible. They went into a concert theater, guns blazing. Okay, that's part of the story. When was this? Was this like in the last 24 hours or something? Um, uh, Mike, I guess it's where you stand on Napoleon. I do not see him as a villain or the um, man he's uh, made out to be by over 200 years of British academic and oligarchical propaganda. So that's... Just so you know, that's where probably much of our disagreement will come from. I don't buy the bullshit about Napoleon Bonaparte. <sighs> Any uh, William Woods, any thoughts on electric universe theory? It's shocking. Shocking, I tell you. <laughs> uh, no, because I haven't really uh, dove into it, and probably I should. Johan Wolf um, asked, have you heard about the Boucher uh, Vaguely. But William Woods, I need to jump into the electric universe theory. Mike does, once again. British hated Napoleon because they were at that time already after the globe. Well, yeah, I say that in my book, The Esoteric Napoleon. Um, that, of course, the primary reason the British, uh, you know, crown and city of London hated Napoleon is, is because he was beating them at their own game. They wanted to rule the world. The British have been bigger, were bigger globalists than Napoleon was big time. And, um, you know, now we're talking about, I'm not talking about my British friends here, my, my friends from the UK, the, the regular people, I, just like our goddamn government and our goddamn political class, you know, um, I'm talking about your political class, your, your bankers, your, you know, your elites, the people are okay. Uh, JT88 asked the question, heard of Clark Ashton Smith. Hmm. You tell them, folks. Have I heard of Clark Ashton Smith? Uh, let's see. I write about him in Destination Carcosa. Yeah, I think I've heard about him. Okay. I'm not going to debate about Napoleon, Mike. Megalithic Yard. Russian shooting was terrorist attack on a concert hall and mall killed at least 123 people. They have arrested 11 of the attackers. Well, friggin' terrorists, you know. I, I, I mean, I don't know what kind of comment anyone would be looking for from me other than you know I hate terrorists. And uh, it's tragic. It truly is. Oh, no, uh, uh, Jay Grinder. Uh, uh, enjoy your Richard Sharp novels. Uh, believe me, uh, you know, I, I like, um, I like the stories of, you know, the, the, uh, British adventurers, you know, um, in the, the red coats and the white pith helmets. I still love the man who would be King and, and Zulu and, and uh, which is, you know, based on a real event. No, you can, of course you can appreciate all that stuff. Um, you know, great stories. And, and those stories are really about the individual men and women doing extraordinary things. Okay. The, the, who they're doing it for, whatever is just the context happened on Thursday in Moscow. I'll take a look at it. Um, Any comment? Are, are you referring to the Phoenix program or is Phoenix something 
separate. The Phoenix program, uh, I've talked about that um, with Todd Wood in the California episodes. Um, you know, there it is uh, using MK Ultra stuff and doing some pretty nefarious, weird things. Um, and who says that, you know, it actually stopped. It's probably just still being done under another name. Hmm. Philip Blair, was Napoleon familiar with the worldwide phrase regarding British Empire untrustworthiness, perfidious Albion? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> no, that's cool, Jay Grinder. No. <laughs> Uh, yes, Shane, it is appearing. Now, remember, folks, um, if um, you're putting a comment or a question up and it's not appearing, a lot of times that's because you're going over the amount of characters that you're permitted to do. And then it'll just erase when you hit enter. It just will erase what you've written. So... Um, try to keep things concise, try to provide some context so that I know what you're talking about. Never assume that I know what you're talking about when you ask a question or ask for a comment on something. And uh, let me see, let me see. Uh, I've been enjoying uh, binging the old detective series Mannix these uh, last few weeks, maybe a month now. Um, my dad used to watch it when I was a kid. There are some fantastic cars on that show. Um, really, if you're, if you're into the Mopar, you know, Hemi cars and stuff. Um, watch Mannix just for that alone. You'll get a, a kick out of it. Shane Walker asks, do you think Tic Tac UFOs are spherical experiencing a time? <laughs> Shane Walker, I think tic the Tic Tac as an extraterrestrial or otherworldly UFO or bullshit. Okay. The Tic Tac object is very much some type of earthly technology that's being developed by uh, U.S. Um, you know military aerospace engineering firms. Okay, uh, so um, I I really doubt that it's and to answer your question specifically, of course, being earthbound doesn't mean it couldn't have time distortions. But here's the thing how the Tic Tac's performance was described to us um, and what it likely was really doing, um, you know, you will find a discrepancy, I think. Um, that's been pointed out by a couple of people, a couple of researchers, that it wasn't really going as fast as um, Fravor and them estimated it to be going. And it wasn't doing the things as extreme as described. So that's why I, I no, I don't think they're spherical. Why don't I think they're spherical? Because of the Navy patents. Look up the U.S. Navy patent, comma, Tic Tac UFO, and you will see why I don't think it's spherical and that it's being stretched because of time or space distortion. Um, it is uh, shaped essentially like a Tic Tac, but, but look it up, U.S. Navy patents and the Tic Tac UFO, and uh, decide for yourself. I know what it tells me, but um, the, the, you know, the Tic Tac UFO thing was just part of the noise, part of the disinformation, part of the spin that the U.S. government um, wanted to force upon 
the UFO community in ufology. Okay. Um, I think I was one of three people I know of when the whole thing, you know, the whole 2017 thing emerged and called bullshit from the get go. And I had people who got angry with me. I mean, would get angry with me over that opinion. And they have since come to realize, oh, you guys were right. Yeah, no shit. I like that megalithic yard. The Tic Tac is product placement. <laughs> you know, seriously, the, the company that makes the Tic Tac mints ought to, ought, ought to get in on that. So, um, anyway, yeah, it's just Saturday here. Um, just kind of a ask me anything kind of day. Philip Blair. Did you know that the disgraced general George Wright, who fought the red Napoleon chief Joseph of the Nez Percy, Nez Perce, had a son named Roswell Wright who died rather young. No, I, I did not know that. Tic Tac. ModWiz125 says, Tic Tac, a sweet sugary thing for the UFO enthusiast mouths. Yes, there you go. There's a good selling point. Hey, by the way, folks, uh, so far there is um, being planned Nimzacon 2. That's Nimzacon 2 uh, to be... Um, to happen in Sonora, California in October. More details to come. D. Dorothy Papineau says, Strange Craft by John Guerra was a topic on DJ's show Friday. I haven't finished watching it. I gotta, I gotta finish watching it. Hmm. Yes, sirree. Just another another Saturday here. We're having rain off and on. Megalithic Yard. Have you looked at the final frames of the movie when worlds collide? Interesting megalithic structures slipped in. Oh, really? Oh, thank you for that tip. Uh, I know what I'll be looking for tonight right before I start watching more episodes of uh, Mannix. Where is Malia tonight? Johnny side asks. Well, she, she had a busy night last night with um, a very lengthy live stream. She does with a friend of hers, a friend and associate who's in Australia and, and the, and another one who's back East here in the States. And they had a marathon and she's just really tired and exhausted um, today so she's just relaxing, and uh, we went and got some Indian food this afternoon right before I jumped on here. So um, I think she might be sleeping that off. <laughs> so um, me, I was kind of wired, so uh, I had the energy to jump on here and, and visit with you fine people. Megalithic Yard says, I will send a screen grab. Thank you. Philip Blair says, I just read this and I'd never seen Roswell as a person's first name before. Oh, yeah, neither have I. That's that's definitely interesting. Modwiz 125, I love the Jules Verne ambiance of Nimza, right? Yeah, the, you can thank Delshaw for that. Definitely. Ah, I have dry mouth today. That's why I'm slipping over my words. Sorry about that. Johnny Side, I will definitely uh, pass on the message. Yes, yes, Indian food is among our favorites. Um, I had tandoori chicken 
in oh boy i've already forgotten but but it's a double b thing uh i can't think of what it is but oh it's it's the red curry base with um eggplant and vegetables and oh man it's so good and i had the tandoori chicken i love tandoori chicken um and of course basmati rice it was wonderful I am an eggplant fan. Um, I've introduced her to several, a few of the Indian restaurants out here, and she's found some on her own. Uh, Malia's incredible with, we'll be on the road. I might have mentioned this before. We'll be on the road out in the middle of nowhere, and um, she'll pull up the, you know, the phone and she'll say, oh, here's a restaurant I want to go to. Go this way, go that way. And she'll even go someplace I'm familiar with, and she'll find some far corner of someplace I'm familiar with and, and just find these restaurants and, and they're fantastic. They're always good. Um, she's got that uh, amazing ability. So I generally take her lead when she says she's going to find one. <laughs> no Indian food so close to podcast time. Well, I don't think she would have made it anyway, cause she was pretty tired from, uh, doing the live stream the last night. Modwiz 125. Vindaloo is the really hot stuff. Indian food is well balanced. Ayurvedic influence. I love Ayurvedic. Ayurvedic influence. Yeah, I, I do love Indian food. And, um, you know, uh, people that say, you know, I don't like it because I don't like the smell of curry. Okay, you go, go to McDonald's, get your damn Big Mac. Go to Denny's, get your moons over my hammy and get your boiled roast beef and your, you know, watery mashed potatoes and have your Yankee food. You're welcome to your Yankee food. There's more good stuff for me. You know, um, I, I, I love the, you walk into this place, we eat at non-cafe, N-A-A-N, like the bread, non-cafe in Redlands. And as soon as you walk in the doors, you just hit with the, the, the cloud of the, the curries and, oh, it's like heaven. It really is. Oregon music fan asks, where can we find the podcast that Malia was on last night? By the way, I love curry. Yeah, yeah you know, what's good for you. Oregon music fan. I'll have to ask her and she can uh, share it with you guys. But, um, her friend who she was on it with is, is in the live streams on Wednesdays and that's Luna. Um, where, where can they find Luna? <laughs> <laughs> Hi guys. Um, Luna's channel. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to add it to the description. box. Yeah. Let's do that. Let's do that. Cause you guys want people to. I could probably get my phone on if you're going to be on a minute and try to put it in there. Okay. Yeah. Um, Oh, oh, I got to get off here soon, though, because you got to um, do some business calls, and I don't want my mouth in the background. So we can add to the description later because I was just going to. So anyway, um, I'm down to talking about Indian food and curry, so that must mean that, uh, you know, we've exhausted um, this evening's topics. And megalithic, uh, like Tim Curry. Yeah, that Curry too. Yeah, he's awesome. Did you see where um, Michael Keaton is returning to the role of Beetlejuice? Saw that little preview. That was interesting. Uh, oh, by the way, folks, before I go, I will be doing um, a, uh, a kind of an open the box video on the model kit that Ron Mears um one of our fellow live chatters here, uh, that Ron Mears sent to me. And it is the, um, uh, the, the Klingon Bird of Prey, the movie version. And it's a pretty good scale. The wingspan is going to be like that. And uh, I'm going to do one of my model kit building, open the box, look at the pieces, discuss it a little bit. Um, I'll probably do that um, if if not tonight, then tomorrow, but it won't be on until tomorrow. So um, if you want to see what Ron Mears sent me, and also he sent me um, this astounding, really cool 
volume. Um, it's uh, The Court of Napoleon, written in uh, 1856, and this is the 1871 edition. Beautiful book. Um, just an incredible volume here. And I uh, can't thank Ron enough for this. Um, it's just, I love these old books. And what's great about this is, um, this is published by an American publisher, okay? And um, I haven't looked into the author yet, but I guarantee you, if it's an American author, there's a more balanced and, and true realistic um, approach to Napoleon than a British author at the time would ever have given, um, except for, uh, of course, Sir Walter Scott and maybe one other. But um, yeah, so I'll be talking more about this book. Again, thank you, Ron Mears. Thank you, thank you, thank you for this. This is just an incredible gift. Um, and thank you for the model kit, which I'll be doing a, a video on. You'll see that uh, by tomorrow. And uh, yes, ModWiz125, buy Walter's books to curry favor with him. <laughs> yeah. Philip Blair says, Yankee Doodles, Noodles, and Pizzeria. Uh, D. Dorothy Papineau says, ask Malia to put it on her channel. I definitely will do that. Johnny Side, hit that like button, show Walter some love. If you already have, thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, folks. Um. Yeah, Tordor Kolev, the court of Napoleon. Yeah, you see, he was uh, emperor and and had a court, right? Um, and then, of course, his nephew was also. Philip Blair, that book looks like a prop in a wizard's library. Oh, thank you, thank you. Speaking of which, I'll be in a wizard's library later this evening, uh, if any of you play World of Warcraft, I'll be in there, uh, Bone Chewer Realm. That's where I play, Bone Chewer. And if you see a hunter, a tall, lithe, statuesque hunter with long red hair, um, and her name is Transgendra, that will be me playing in the World of Warcraft with my hunter character. That's right. You heard right. Transgendra is her name, and I've been playing her for 10 years now. 2014, I created that character, and she's my uh, primary. Um, so, Bone Chewer Realm. I'll be in the World of Warcraft later. I do play World of Warcraft. I love World of Warcraft. I'm not really great at it, but I, I just enjoy playing. I like exploring. Oh, and now I can fly in um, Kul Tiris. Yeah. I can fly in all the realms now because I haven't bought the expansion. Joey Charlie, LOL transgender. That's right. <laughs> I like to have fun. And Joey, um, I have some character names that I won't repeat here because I have a little fun. I said a couple of weeks ago, a couple episodes back, I have a little fun with, um, with uh, naughty character names. In World of Warcraft, I, I push the limit to see what I can get away with. Uh, Mike does been playing StarCraft for 20 years. Oh, cool, Mike. You're probably a lot better at StarCraft than I am at World of Warcraft. <laughs> and I've never played StarCraft either, so you ought to try World of Warcraft. I should probably try StarCraft. Mick Connolly. Walter, check out the movie... Steam Boy. Oh, I I think um, my kid has a copy of that, so I will watch it after all these years. I think I've seen parts of it. It is cool. Yeah, Mike uh, Starcraft really is one of the uh, one of the originals. That's for sure. Uh, and an ex girlfriend of mine in the past. Um, got me into World of Warcraft and The Sims also. So I haven't played Sims in a long time, but um, got into World of Warcraft, um, introduced to by her in 2005, and um, kind of goofed around on it for a couple of years and then um, returned to it 
Oh, maybe maybe transgender is more than ten years old. I'll have to I'll have to look back. I'm thinking it was 2014 that I jumped right back into it regularly. So, okay, folks, I think that's enough for tonight. Um, two hours of Walter Bosley is enough for anyone, and it's too much for some, for many. And I want to thank all of you in the live chat for your questions and, and uh, sh showing up. I want to thank all the viewers. Um, we have a pretty good turnout tonight. Um, I, uh, I'm going to be trying to get, I'm going to try to get Seshari on this coming Wednesday. Um, so for those of you who asked, when can I have Seshari on or when am I going to have him on? I'm hoping to get him on Wednesday. So um, look forward to that. And uh, let's see, I'll let you know when I'm going to be on DJ as soon as he lets me know. And um, yeah, uh, I'll be working on uh, various projects. One of them is we're doing NimsaCon 2 in October in Sonora, California. Philip Blair, Audible just added a bunch of transgender and genderqueer science fiction, also some interesting Native American horror fiction. Oh, okay. Okay, you guys know that I have written five books, um, novels, works of fiction, that involve transgender characters, uh, three pulps. In fact, in fact, here are my pulp novels right here. Um, these three feature... Uh, transgender characters. Uh, and I was writing this um, House of Ka I wrote in 2005, the first draft. Okay. So I, I'm kind of a pioneer in this topic. And Green Ghost, I wrote the first draft in 2010. Okay. And uh, You Will Be Mine, the first draft of that was also written, I think, in 2011. And um, this is... Uh, this is what I call my trans trilogy, and it has to, and look, I get into hermetic and occult themes, alchemical themes with this, okay? Um, these aren't just titillating sex books. Um, notice I said not just. <laughs> and then the, uh, the uh, Amazon, the Secret of the Amazon Queen um, and uh, Tropic of Despair feature transgender, um, androgynous characters as well, hermaphroditic, whatever you want to call them, um, in the case of those characters. So these are themes that I have explored, um, when, uh, you know, Joseph Farrell and Scott DeHart referred to Amazon Queen as an alchemical novel. So, you know, don't let bigotry get in the way of, uh, an interesting intellectual read, okay? And I know you don't, Philip Blair. But um, there we go. There we go. So, okay, folks. Um, again, thank you all. Have a good night. And we will see you on Wednesday.